Good morning. My name is Bill Moore. Uh, I'm the discipleship pastor at Restoration Church, and um, our sermon today is called Now is the Time to Serve. Now is the Time to Serve. But I, I need to start off with a bit of a confession. So in seminary, the professors all tell you when you for preaching is that you need to have a single point and be highly focused on what that is. Um, this isn't one of those sermons. Uh, this is going to kind of gonna map on a lot of different things. I hope that what your experience is like uh, a canvas that gets um, all different colors over it, and eventually that they come together to make a beautiful picture. That's my goal. Um, anyway, I think we have some good stuff to dive into, but just want to give you a heads up from the beginning. So our sermon series, uh, Now is the Time, we're, to, we're taking a deep dive into our vision as a church. Um, and hopefully that this, the, the vision statement that you've tattooed it somewhere, maybe on your arm, um, or at least that you've tattooed it on your heart, and that it's been resonating deeply within you, and that it's been giving you ideas of what, what this might look like for us to live this out as a church. Um, and my guess is that some parts of it have, have struck you. Uh, maybe that the imperfect people part, or life-restoring grace of Jesus, or the idea of embrace. And you wouldn't be at fault if one of the things that hadn't quite struck you was this middle phrase, helping our community. Because on the surface, it sounds almost a little bit blasé or weak, but I think this phrase is rich and it's deep. And it's not just, it's not just there because we couldn't find other bigger, better words that, were, that would fit, but because this word is significant. And this word speaks to what we're called to as a church. So this morning that I want to not just convince you of that, but I want you this to be a chance where you get to remember what this means and that, it, that you take it with you. So, and if you're joining for the first time, here is our vision statement that we are, are living in, that we're seeking to live into as a church. We're seeking to be imperfect people, helping our community embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus together. Imperfect people helping our community embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus together. Now, last week, Jeff challenged us to be imperfect people, people who are captured and captivated by the grace of God, knowing that we're imperfect, and that's okay because God's strength is in our weakness. This week, we're looking at helping our community, and specifically, we're talking about when we speak of our community, those in a one, three, or five-mile radius of where our new um, church building is going to be, but also in a one, three, and, and five-minute walk radius from wherever you live. When we're thinking about our community, we think about both those things, both if you were to draw circles on the map around the former Ratley Library, as well as who can you get to in walking distance from your house or that you walk by in the, in the different places you live, work, and play. Now, on the surface, that helping is incredibly obvious. I mean, right, Christians are called to love their neighbor. Um, I mean, that's, that's part of what it means to be a Christian. And, you know, helping like is means supporting, joining, encouraging, coming alongside, organizing, just doing things that people can't do for themselves. Um, I mean, we do these things with our Bless Our Neighbors Day, cleaning, cutting, raking, kind of doing whatever outdoor work we, we can for people. Um, and it also means having a empathy and compassion for people. And this is something that I think that as a church that we do well, that we are, tend to be oriented towards service and helping people out. And like whether this happens with moves or with meals or with d or other things, that all of this is stuff that we do, that we show up when we need to help. And this is a beautiful thing. And I know for me personally is that I have, and this is nothing against my seminary education, but I've been shaped more about what it means to be generous through watching people in this church than I have through all of the theology I learned. Because when we see it lived out, it shapes us and it changes us. However, <clears throat> and you probably figured that this was coming, is that when we look to Jesus, Jesus reframes our notions of what helping means. That when we look to Jesus, it takes a different nuance and a spin and a focus, and it becomes deeper and richer. By analogy, let me, I'll explain it this way. Um, so when I was a senior in college, that I chose Syrian drama. Um, and I got to play the noble Claudio. He was so noble um, that, uh, that even though that he, while he was in jail, he tried to get his sister to free him from jail by forming an inappropriate relationship with the judge. He was a noble person. Anyway, but the point is that 
when I learned the lines, like I would read over the script and say, ah, here he is angry. Here he is distraught. Here he is. And the, the temptation is just to read the lines overlaying that emotion. And that does something, and that kind of gets at the basic sense of what it is. But what I learned is that actually how to live into that character meant to like to get the lines in my bones and to let the lines and memorizing them and meditating on them shape and nuance and deepen and enrich my character. And so it wasn't just that I was overlaying an emotion that I was acting on top of the lines, but I was letting the lines and the call of the drama shape how I lived those. And it brought much more nuance and richness. I still don't know if I was very good, but I tried hard. Anyway, what I want to do about helping is the same kind of thing. I don't want us just to kind of overlay, hey, we should help people on top of what we think it means to follow Jesus, but let Jesus shape and reframe what it means to actually help. So the, <clears throat> the first thing, so what, what I want to do is I want to kind of give a, a little bit of a d- definition for helping, kind of put some, some stuff on, onto the word help. But then I want to talk about the internal dynamics of helping. And I think this is really where uh, God's word speaks more deeply to us. Um, so we're going to start kind of with a definition, but then look at some of the internal dynamics of helping. So from a definition standpoint, the first thing that if you read the Old Testament that you see is that helping is a strong powerful word. So one of the first places you see it is that the woman who God made for the man in the garden calls her, her his, uh, his helper. But most of the time in the uh, Old Testament, that when, it's, when the word helper is used, it's referred, to, it, it's, the reference is God. God is my help. God is my helper. God is the one who comes to my aid. And so when you look at it from that point, that helping is a strong a rich and mighty word that implies just a great power, but also a unique fitness to be able to use that power in a certain situation. Um, similarly, that the word help implies kind of a closeness and an intimacy, that you can't just help people from a distance, but you actually have to help people by personally knowing their needs and coming alongside them in a way. That helping isn't just something that you kind of make some grand strategies and plans and initiatives for, is that helping is something that you engage in in the nitty-gritty of life with people, that that's what helping looks like. Um, And finally, one of the things you need to notice about our vision statement is that when we talk about helping, it isn't just a, hey, we want to be helpers. We want to be do-gooders. But it says that imperfect people helping our community, what? Helping our community embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus. So that frames and shapes the kind of helping that we want to do. It isn't just helping for helping's sake or helping for being good sake, but helping for a purpose, helping for a goal that it isn't just lending a hand to people, but helping to lead them to the love of God, that that's what we want our helping to look like. Now, just real quickly, one objection people might say, well, but doesn't that, doesn't that bring in ulterior motives to our helping? Doesn't that make it non-altruistic? I mean, can it really be real help if you have a motive? And just to be clear, what we're not saying is that you only help people if they do, if they um, trust Jesus, but that we help people in order that they might, that that is our hope and that is our, um, that is our desire. And if you think about it, did God send his son only to people who would respect him? Or from another, did Jesus have ulterior motives when dying on the cross? I mean, no, these things are ridiculous. The way God shows his love is continually overflowing, but it's for a purpose. Because God, just like we should, wants the highest and best for each person. And so that's what we desire in our helping, that we want the very best for them, not just to relieve a need so we can check it off the list, but that we want the very best for people, that they might embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus together. So um, now in many cases that this perspective about helping may not change exactly what we do, but it changes what happens in here. Because it's not something that we just kind of do as it fits in our schedule, but it might actually become deep and personal to our hearts. Um, so if the kind of the rough definition that we're looking at is uh, from helping is a purposeful, particular, powerful service in the lives of others, um, now let's look at the internal dynamics of what helping, um, what helping looks like and what happens when we help in Jesus' way. 
Uh, to do this, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9. Um, so Matthew is, is the first account of Jesus's life and ministry. Um, it's the first book of the New Testament, if you open your Bible. Uh, and we're going to be in Matthew 9 and following. And what Jesus does is that he gets ready to commission his disciples to be short-term itinerant ministers. And I think that in that, we get a paradigm for what helping looks like. And what we're going to see um, in this is that we're going to see three big truths. Helping hones, helping hurts, and helping heals. Helping hones, helping hurts, and helping heals. So that's, that's where we're going. So let's, let's kick it off um, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 36. It says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, what Jesus, Jesus' next step here in the passage is surprising, because if I'm a disciple, I'm thinking, man, Jesus is having so much success with this ministry, we need to build on this. We need to make it bigger and better. We need to build something so more people can come here. We need to set up layers of administration so that people can have pre-screenings so that they can get the help as quick as possible because they've met with five other people before actually getting to Jesus. We need to set up a food bank. We need to set up a literacy clinic. We need to, that, that's what I might be thinking as a disciple, like, man, Jesus is really helping people. We need to make this thing bigger. People will flock to it. We can advertise. Take that, Caesar. Forget Rome. Come to Jesus. That might be how I would have thought. But this isn't what Jesus does, that he doesn't see his disciples as prom promoters or bureaucrats or um, just middlemen, but he sees us as co-workers, as co-helpers. Um, helping begins when we embrace this reality of being co-workers with Jesus. And continuing on, he, sa he says this to them. He says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. They've seen that. But the workers are few. That's the need, more workers. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And he does. He Later on, if you read the passage more, he commissions his helpers to go um, and spread the kingdom and bring healing wherever they go. Now, so to connect the dots, just so we're clear, when Jesus sees the need for help, he doesn't say we need a more centralized system. He says we need workers. We need helpers. We need people to go. And all throughout the Bible, this is what God does, that he scatters his people and spreads them in the world that they might be agents of his restoration and his redemption. He doesn't say, hey, let's centralize this. Let's have one powerful figure be the person who disseminates that. He says, no, go, go and make disciples, go and spread my kingdom. And so just when we say that we are imperfect people helping our community, that it means that we're going out that it means that we're engaging people where we live, where we work, where we play, um, not just to people who might come through our doors or come through our web page on Sunday mornings. So Jesus calls us to help in part because helping hones, helping sharpens, helping develops. Uh, when you look at Jesus' ministry, one of the things you'll notice is that even though he's doing a lot for other people, that he is always doing stuff for his disciples in order that they might grow and be developed as good disciples. They might carry on his work when he's gone. Helping hones. He is training them so that they can do his work after them. He is honing them and shaping them to be his people. Now notice in this passage we just read, where does helping begin? It begins with prayer and obedience. He calls them to pray and, and says, this is where helping begins. It begins with prayer. Helping starts on our knees, and when we start there, God shapes us. And this is, this is really convicting for me because um, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about our new space, and I'm incredibly excited about especially this season of preparation until we get there because there are all these initiatives and strategies and things that I want to do and kind of bring things together that we can make happen, and what could it be, what could it be? But the way Jesus asks us to begin our help is on our knees. In prayer. Like, I just want to get straight to work and start doing, 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 doing. But Jesus calls us first to prayer. Um, and the sense is that, like, that, that as we pray, that this is how we're shaped to be who we're called to be. 
Uh, Leonard Ravenhill writes about prayer in this way, um, especially speaking about the lack of it in our society. Listen to what he says. He says, Poverty-stricken as the church is today, in many things she is most stricken here in the place of prayer. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. The the call first and foremost to help our community is prayer. That's why it's not just about being do-gooders, but it's about praying and seeing where God might lead us specifically. So we need to pray. Fundamentally, first, always. We have to pray and obey. And when we do this, that helping hones us to be more, to be better disciples of Jesus. But helping also hurts. If you skim over Matthew 10, that you'll realize that the task Jesus gives his disciples is no cakewalk. Um, in fact, it's going to hurt and require sacrifice. Jesus frames it this way. Look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Uh, Jesus kind of paints a stark picture um, for his disciples of the kinds of persecutions that will inevitably follow any disciple of his. That it will not be a cake. Well, it will not be easy. Helping hurts. Now, for the disciples, it meant arrest, flogging, betrayal. Um, for us, it might mean those things. It might mean different things. But either way, that helping hurts. And so when we're seeking to actually help, our, here's questions that we need to ask ourselves. Are, am I? Are we prepared to lose status and respectability? Are we ready to be marginalized and misunderstood? <clears throat> are we okay with others taking advantage of our generosity? Are we okay, here's a big one, people leaving messes? in our new space? What about having equipment broken or stolen? Are we okay with that? Are we ready to lose sleep, give time, and sacrifice financially so that others might embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus? Are we ready for those things? Helping hurts. This is some of the internal reality of helping. That That's why it's not something we just kind of do on our side that we check off, but that helping hurts, that it requires much of us. And later in the passage, that Jesus insists um, this is exactly what he has always been saying and what he's going to model himself. He says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me, is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. There is no other way around. Helping hurts. And if you think about Jesus, if there would have been any way to help without hurt, Jesus would have done it. But we look to Jesus and see that he died on the cross, not as an unfortunate series of events that he couldn't control, but because this was exactly what he was called to do. When God came and showed us what it meant, like what his character was, it involved sacrifice. Helping hurts. It always will. However, helping ultimately heals. So we've been talking about this all, all throughout, but just to camp on this for a second, that when Jesus sends his to be restorers, to help those who are helpless, to even help those who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, even though they might be acting like wolves, that they need a shepherd. And so the healing that Jesus brings isn't just though bodily or material, that is at the soul level, that he heals by being our shepherd and restoring our souls. Jesus puts it this way at the end of the section that we've been looking at. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. As helpers, we get to share this invitation with people, recognizing that it is not us who does these things for people. We are not imperfect people forcing others to embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus, that we are imperfect people helping others to embrace 
the life restoring grace of Jesus, pointing the way. And what's beautiful about this is that this isn't just a one time invitation, but this is a reoccurring event. Jesus says that as we take his yoke, trusting him as master, following him in the way he's calling us to help, being honed, being hurt, that he also heals us. That in doing that, we find rest for our souls. So it is in the way of Jesus that we are healed as well. Now, I don't want to kind of force this image, but kind of going back to the Shakespeare illustration, is that as that I began to... <clears throat> to <clears throat> meditate on those lines and imbibe them. They just didn't become something that I said, but they kind of became something that I embodied in how I acted. And I think that Jesus' commands, and especially the letters in the New Testament, give us the same kind of picture. That there aren't just kind of practical phrases to apply and to slap on top of our life and say, okay, I've checked that. We meditate and chew on these scriptures, that they shape who we are on the inside. And we become to embody them, to embody the way of Jesus and the way of his people in the world so that we can be people who extend life-restoring grace to other people. This is my hope, and this is our prayer. So to recap, is that our vision is helping our community embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus. This isn't just by giving a handout or a hand up, but it is by leading people to God. And that this is something that we engage personally and purposefully, knowing that helping hones, helping hurts, but helping also heals. And at this point, we're going to bridge into our offering because as people who were called, were called to help, that when we give our offering, that it is a way that we say to Jesus, yes, I want to be about your purposes. Shape me to be more like you. Let me even suffer if I have to because I desire to bring healing in this world. And so we, we give our time. We give our talents. We give our, our treasures. We give these things to Jesus saying, you have your way among us. Um, so there'll be ways that you can see different ways to give um, on the screen. Um, but I'm, I want to pray for this offering, but I also want to lead us in a time of prayer, praying that we would be the kind of people who want to be about Jesus's work in the world. So let's, let's pray together. Uh, Jesus, you call us to ask for laborers and workers and helpers to be sent into our community. And so right now, even as we're giving um, our, our offerings and as we're contemplating what this means for us, God, we pray for our community. We pray for our neighborhoods, for our streets, um, for those who are in walking distance of our new space, for those who will be driving by our space on a daily basis. Um, God, we pray that you would send helpers to those people. We pray that you would send people who will be courageous for your name, who will want to honor you in all that they do. God, pray that you would send workers send helpers. God, we also ask that you would send us, that we pray that you would lead us to where you'd have us to go, and pray that you would help us to give our lives to you. Now, there are so many things to worry about in this world. There's so many confusing things that we can be stalled out sometimes, but pray that you would send us, not worrying about what our future is going to be, but trusting in you. And so we give you these offerings, we give you our lives open-handed today, asking that you would take these things and work in a powerful way. We pray all of this in the matchless and holy and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. And all God's people said, amen. Um, as we, before we go to uh, the rest of our, um, our time where we get to sing these things back to God, um, that I wanted just to speak real quick on, on giving us some ideas of how our new space might be able to be a place where we, where we can help our community from. Uh, one of the ideas that's been really helpful for me is thinking about our space as a base camp and thinking of it as a place where resources might be, um, might, be might, um, might stay, might be built together, where people could come to hear things, but also where we where it's a springboard to send us out into mission wherever we go. Um, so I imagine that probably during the week that there will be things that we try to offer uniquely to our community as a way to help, uh, where we might be inviting people in. But I think one of the biggest things that we'll do in our space is it'll be a place of training and encouragement and prayer to send us out into our community. 
even the way that the space is laid out on Sunday mornings, is that there are a ton of spaces that can be used for different things. Most of the spaces are smaller, and this is somewhat intentional because one of the things that I envision seeing the space look like is that we can have small pockets of people meeting together for prayer and encouragement on Sunday mornings, that we might be sent out for larger classes, and there's a good and right time for that. But there's also needs to be space and opportunity for people to gather for encouragement and prayer to be sent out. And so that's one of the things that I'm excited about um, for our space, of seeing how it might be a base camp to propel us into ministry to help our community. So those are some of the things that get, that get me excited. Um, I hope that there are things that are getting you excited as well as we continue to dream and ask God to help us live into the vision that he has for us, that Ephesians says that he has prepared good works in advance for us to do. And so our job is to figure out what those things are, that we can walk into them faithfully. So as we do that, we now we're going to sing uh, the next song called Living Hope. Um, so I'm going to take it, send it back to the studio as they, as they lead us in thinking and singing about the, God, the work that God has done and is still doing in the world. <laughs> 